Hey, and welcome to our February workshop, everyone. Uh, sound in film with George Sedaris, that's our topic for today. Um, I wanna thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, just to get this out of the way, as you all probably know, Campus Movie Fest or CMF, uh, as we like to call it, is the world's largest student film festival, helping over a million students around the world share their stories through film. And on behalf of CMF, we're so glad to have you all here. Uh, I think we can all agree that sound is a huge part of any film and uh, we'll never be good enough at it. Uh, so just a couple of reminders here before we begin our workshop. We'll be pausing throughout the present presentation today to have George, our presenter, answer your questions. So please make sure to go to the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, specifically the Q&A icon. Um, anything right in the post uh, in the chat uh, will uh, unfall, it'll fall on deaf ears. Uh, so, no one's looking at that. Q&A is what we're going to be using to send these questions over to George, and he will happily answer them for you there. I'll help relay those throughout the presentation as well. Uh, so now for the fun part, let's get to the actual workshop itself. So Campus Movie, Campus Movie Fest is excited to have George with us today. Uh, George is a creative technologist from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he's been working in audio and film for seven years, among many other things in the creative industry. And uh, I'll let him dive a little bit deeper into his, into his um, I like to call it like a Renaissance man like resume. Uh, George pretty much does everything, but we're so glad to have him here talking specifically about sound. So, uh, George, take it away. All right. Really appreciate it. I just want to say thank you to Campus Movie Festival for having me here to do this lecture. Um, hi, everybody. My name is George. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I have a master's in music technology and a bachelor's in music production and music business. Um, I've been, I have been working in film for about seven plus years, um, primarily in audio, but now I've gotten a little bit more into the creative direction of film. And uh, I work a lot with corporate video um, right now. But today, I'd like to talk to you about sound. So let's get that going. Oops, sorry, meeting controls. <laughs> okay, here we are. All right, sound for film. So this is a little bit more about me. Um, I used to be a professor of audio production, uh, but now I'm working as a creative director for a company called Network Frequency. Um, and I work as a creative media consultant. My website link is at the bottom. It's also at the end of the presentation. And I think this will be available um, not only to watch later, but we can make sure that the PowerPoint is uh, accessible. So um, let's get started. So an overview, uh, there are three types of sound in film, dialogue, music, and sound effects. So dialogue typically consists of narration uh, and voiceovers, uh, and then we have location sound. So narration, um, think about pretty much any documentary you've ever watched. Um, BBC Earth is a really good example of that. Uh, where you have somebody speaking over the video that you're watching and explaining what's going on, but not necessarily someone you see on screen. Whereas location sound is typically recorded on set. And we'll get a little bit deeper into these um, as we go along here. Then we have music, which we call a score. So the score is the music of the film. Uh, and then we have sound effects or SFX. And we have a few different types of sound effects. We have momentary and we have constant. Uh, momentary is kind of a singular one-time sound, whereas constant sounds are ambience. You know, imagine like if you're in the jungle or something, you're going to hear uh, maybe water running and leaves rustling and birds in the background kind of thing. Um, why is sound important in film? So sound helps create a sense of place and location. It helps create a sense of realism or surrealism. It can help tell the story uh, and set the mood, the feel, and the theme. It adds drama. It can also fill in knowledge gaps when visual elements are not enough for the viewer. Uh, so for instance, hearing footsteps prior to seeing someone on screen, you know, somebody's walking up into the frame, but you can hear them before you see them. Uh, it, it really helps tell the story. And even since early days of film, uh, people have been using sound effects and music and dialogue to, to really help tell the story. Um, let's talk some about the history. So early days of film, um, some early films did have sound, just wasn't synchronized. And when I say synchronized, it means the sound 
always lines up to the video. Uh, most films included music. So uh, in the 1920s, some film performances would include a live orchestra or a band or some live musicians that would play music that would fit the mood of the scenes. Uh, and that just kind of helped give a little bit of um, a little bit more life to the film. Uh, sound effects were incorporated first in radio programs to give more life and drama to the stories. These sounds would happen live uh, because there was not really an easy way to play pre-recorded samples at the time. And this required extra staff to perform them. So there would be people in the background, you know, if there was if there was like a storm in the story, there would be somebody uh, sprinkling something to create the sound of rain and there would be somebody else shaking, you know, a sheet of metal to uh, simulate thunder. Uh, but this all of this stuff moved forward into film uh, and the first film recognized with a synchronized score was Don Juan in 1926. Audio was recorded using a device called the Vitaphone and this is an extremely complicated device um, and it didn't record a uh, long um, it didn't record long periods of time so it was not the most accurate device but uh, we had to start somewhere so um, Dialogue didn't actually come until a little bit later. So the first film that had synchronized dialogue was The Jazz Singer from 1927. Uh, in this era, people were already listening to musical recordings, but this film was the very first to actually have spoken synchronized dialogue. So here's Don Juan from 1926. It had synced music and sound effects. So I'm going to pause that here. Um, the reason that this film was so impressive is this is using location sound and you can actually go to Warner Brothers YouTube channel and watch a whole thing on the Vita phone and how they used it to record the sound of this film. Um, like I said, this was one of the first, this was the first uh, film with uh, synced music and sound effects. So let's continue on here. So here's the jazz singer. And the really impressive part about this film, as I mentioned before, is that it had synced dialogue. So while that may not seem like it's groundbreaking today because we have lots of movies with really impressive sound, uh, this really blew people away because it was the first time they'd heard people talking on screen. Um, obviously there had been recorded music and radio was a very popular thing at the time, but this uh, really changed the trajectory of the film industry. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about dialogue. So what we just heard was recorded live on set using the Vita phone. Uh, but there are times where what's recorded on set may not necessarily be acceptable for multiple reasons. So we have a process called overdubbing and automated, uh, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> automated dialogue replacement or ADR. And I'm going to refer to that many times throughout this. Um, so overdubbing is the process used to replace the location sound due to changes in script, performance, or poor recording quality. Sometimes sets are noisy. Uh, sometimes there's lots of reverberation or poor acoustics on set. And sometimes it just doesn't record correctly. So it, you may have a microphone that's turned up too high or too low, and you just don't get a good recording. And sometimes, uh, for instance, let's say there's a scenario where somebody created a film and let's say it's R-rated, but they have to make a PG-13 version of it for television or even a PG version of it for television. Um, one that comes to mind is the Blues Brothers. Uh, there's a lot of cursing in the movie if you watch it not on television, but on television, they actually overdubbed the curse words uh, with not as bad words. And in my opinion, I think it's really funny instead of just uh, beeping them out. But that's a really good example of overdubbing because they actually had all of the actors in that film overdub over those curse words so they could have the TV uh, ready version of the movie. So ADR is a process where actors will actively watch the scenes and redo their dialogue as it's happening on screen. So they'll actually be watching themselves on screen and redo their lines. Uh, and this actually started in the 1930s. And it initially required actors to attempt to deliver the dia dialogue at the exact pacing of the location sound. It was very difficult, very tedious, um, very resource intensive. But now computers have str uh, streamlined this process considerably making it a whole lot easier to do and you can manually move things around so if somebody's you know a little early or a little late uh on software you can just click and drag and it's fixed um sound effects and foley so foley uh is a completely different process uh than just creating the sound but you may be familiar with it because of um how radio had sound effects. So sound effects were present in films as early as the 1920s. Initially, they were recorded as part of the location sound, but it just didn't really end up to be a reliable process. Uh, because you also have people talking on location, and you have other sounds in the background, and it just it wasn't very reliable. Uh, so sound effects are split into two processes or two categories, sound design and Foley. Uh, Foley is the older part of sound effects. It was the original method adding uh, sound effects to film. And it's named after Jack Foley, who was the first person, uh, first known person to decide to watch the film while performing and recording the sound effects live to be synced with the film. Now, this was not actually on location. This was in a studio somewhere that was set up for this purpose. Foley uh, typically results in a more realistic or more in more realistic sound effects since it's more performative than picking uh, pre-made samples that may or may not totally fit. Uh, Foley's origin was from how sound effects were, for, were performed live to enhance uh, early radio broadcasts. The interesting thing about Foley a lot of the time is that what you hear is not actually what you see. Uh, and I'll get a little bit deeper into this when we discuss sound design a little bit later in greater detail. Sound design itself is a newer process where sounds can be sequenced along with the film. Uh, the term sound designer was coined by Francis Ford Coppola when working with Walter Murch on Apocalypse Now in 1979. The difference between Foley and sound design is Foley is recorded live while watching the film, while sound design can be done asynchronously. That means you don't have to actually be actively watching the entire film and acting the sounds out. You can place the sounds on a timeline and are not actually recording them. But both methods are used extensively today. I'd be willing to bet at least a few people watching this did not realize uh, a lot of the sounds you've heard, even in documentaries, and especially in documentaries, are not actually the ones on set. Um, interesting thing about nature documentaries is a lot of the time they'll have to go record the animals later or they'll find somewhere that there's a rescue that they can record them a little bit closer because for instance you can't really put a microphone in front of a lion uh, for obvious safety reasons so yeah a lot of the sounds 
in film are not actually what you're looking at. So let's talk about the current state of sound for film. So that's kind of the history. Um, dialogue. So dialogue consists of narration and voiceover. In both cases, these are a recorded dialogue uh, that is not spoken by someone visible on the screen. Um, in the case of voiceover, a character may be on screen, but not the original voiceover artist. Uh, it's typically recorded in an acoustically treated studio using a condenser microphone where the narrator will watch the film for accurate timing. In some cases, the voiceover artists or VO artists, and I realize I misspelled voiceover, <laughs> will record in their homes. Uh, this is actually really common these days. A lot of cartoons um, are not actually recorded all in the same place, except for really popular ones, but I'm sure things have changed with COVID. I know for sure um, Archer, they would actually get together and record on set. But a lot of the time these days, uh, people will record out of their own home studios. Uh, recording sessions will be run by a recording engineer if it's in a studio. Dialogue, uh, location sound dialogue. So location sound refers to dialogue recorded on set or on location. This is the most common way to capture dialogue, typically recorded using either a shotgun microphone or a lavalier microphone. Lavaliers are the ones that typically clip on, um, on your collar. Shotgun microphones, uh, there's a picture of a shotgun microphone covered by a windscreen uh, to the right here. Um, those will be plugged into a field recorder, which is a portable recording device, high quality recording device. Uh, occasionally, omnidirectional microphones are used. So that's a microphone that can accept sound from every direction. Now, that's not to say that there are microphones that can only accept sound from one direction because sound moves outwards. It does not move in a linear fashion in the human hearing range. Um, shotgun microphones, they're the most directional microphones, but are not unidirectional. Uh, location sound is not always the highest quality. There's a really high potential for noise. It's sometimes and typically replaced later uh, in the production process with ADR. So ADR, automated dialogue replacement, as we talked about before, it's a means of replacing and then syncing new dialogue, usually in a studio, to the original location sound using software. This is usually performed to get better dialogue uh, audio quality because sometimes location sound is not recorded well enough. You could have a noisy set. Um, something as simple as a polyester jacket could be enough to completely ruin a dialogue take on set. But if the wardrobe requires it, ADR is the move. Uncommonly, it's used to change dialogue if script changes were made after shooting. Uh, typically in this case, they will use multiple angles um, multiple camera angles to go away from the face of the person speaking so that you don't actually know they didn't say that. This process is usually and almost always recorded in a studio uh, that is acoustically treated. Uh, they use a condenser microphone or they'll use the same shotgun microphone they used on set for consistency. After recording, the audio is synced manually or automatically. Um, there's some great software that does this automatically for us. It'll listen. You can, you can give it the original onset take and then show it a new one. It's also really good in music. Uh, but there's a company called Synchro Arts that makes two pieces of software that do this. One's called Vocal Line. The other one's called Revoice Pro. So here is a goofy scene, um, from Logan. It's actually not dialogue, but it is ADR. So <laughs> that might seem pretty goofy, but sometimes you just don't get good location sound. Um, and if if you don't see the chat, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function. We have a Q&A point coming up pretty soon. Uh, so yeah, so this this is a form of ADR. Sometimes you need to re-record grunts and screams and heavier breathing uh, because miking 
Hugh Jackman running through the woods in the middle of a fight scene is not exactly the most practical thing to do. Uh, editing and mixing dialogue. So once you have the dialogue, it's not done yet. That's kind of the first step of dialogue is recording it. But then you need to clean it up. You need to make it sound right. So dialogue editing typically occurs during the video editing as the dialogue has to stay synced to the, to the film. Uh, typically, the video editors on larger productions will work with some sort of audio supervisor. But in smaller productions, the video editor will be the one cutting up the audio or at least the dialogue um, and then we'll pass along the dialogue to a mixing engineer using a digital audio workstation or DAW that's audio software uh, Pro Tools, Ableton, Cubase, Nuendo, Reaper there's tons of different ones out there that can all accomplish very similar goals uh, in a mixing room a dedicated mixing room so this room is one that's acoustically treated to have a clear and flat frequency response. Or you can use headphones with a flat frequency response or now there's software that can make your headphones have a flat frequency response. Uh, the reason that's so important is because you can mix something that sounds good in one studio, but if it's not acoustically treated well, it won't necessarily translate to other studios or theaters or these days a lot of people watch stuff on their phones. Uh, translation between devices is extremely, extremely important. And that's why having an acoustically treated room for mixing is really important. Um, dialogue editing and mixing sessions will be completed typically with one scene per project file. Nobody's sitting there with, you know, a two and a half hour movie in their software, uh, partly because the computer would not have a good time with that. Uh, and something from like the Avengers, a five minute scene could have hundreds of audio channels because of sound effects and dialogue and music and all that other stuff. Um, so it can be really processor intensive. And once that mix is complete, the dialogue mix will be passed to the audio post production mixer, which we'll talk about post production later. Uh, dialogue related jobs, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into the jobs towards the end of this, but we have a location sound recordist or boom operator. That's the person holding the microphones on set. You have a location sound mixer. A location sound mixer is actually somebody who may be on set doing kind of a rough mix. Sometimes you have to uh, submit what we call dailies, which are, it's pretty much the work that you did that day and a polished enough version so you can send it to uh, the producers to uh, check it out. Then we have a mixing engineer. This is typically in the post-production process. We have an ADR engineer, which can be production and post-production, uh, and then a voiceover artist. So these are kind of your dialogue related jobs besides being an actual actor. Uh, now we have music. So we're gonna, uh, the Q&A session will be at the end of this, or there will be a Q&A section for dialogue and music um, at the end of this little section. So music in film. So the music in film is called a score. Scores are written by composers. Uh, scores help set the mood of scenes and tell the story from an emotional standpoint. They're comprised of individual songs or cues. We call them cues. Uh, cues are typically split between scenes. Scores can be comprised of recorded live instruments, audio samples, synthesized sounds, and more. Pretty much any sound you can think of can be part of a score. There are movies where all the sound effects line up with the score uh, because that's just a creative way they wanted to do it. Practically any modern DAW is fit for scoring with the right instruments, samples, and effects available. Like working with dialogue, score cues are split into one session per cue. So becoming a composer, um, is, it can be very rewarding because you get to help tell the story. Uh, and you, you'll work a lot with uh, directors in music. Okay, so scoring related jobs in film. So we have composers. Those are the people who actually write the music. Uh, you can also have musicians. Musicians could be on this list, but um, in that case, we call that a session musician. That's somebody who gets hired to play their instrument for various things. It could be for pop music. It could be for film. Lots of different things in that. Um, the music director. So music director is somebody who actually oversees the music of the film. You have the music editor and then you have mixing engineers and music licensors. So sometimes in film, they have to license music uh, because it's copyrighted. For instance, if somebody wanted to use, you know, a new hip hop or pop track in their film, they're going to have to get a license from the 
uh, publisher of that artist. So dialogue and music Q&A. Let's get some questions. Hey there. Uh, hey. So <laughs> this is all awesome. Thank you so much again for, for going so in depth with all this. Um, oh, no problem. <laughs> first question I have for you today mm -hmm. is from Claudio Datis from the New York Film Academy. Okay. Uh, who has a very interesting question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. It's uh, when is the best time to use silence? Or when, you know, oh. maybe we can even broaden that to when would, you know, what, how can that be used to its best effect? Right. So I think pure silence in film is actually a not great thing to use. And I'll explain why. Um, we can create the perception of silence. So if you're, if you're in a room by yourself right now, so let's say like if I stop talking right now, you may hear some background noise. You may hear a little bit of like a fan running from your computer, or you may hear the HVAC system, or, you know, let's say you're out in the woods. You're, it's not going to be pure silence. So the idea is you can create a the, the perception of silence and, and quiet by using things like ambience, uh, locational ambi uh, excuse me, <laughs> locational ambience to kind of create the idea of silence without it actually being silent. I use this a lot in music also where, um, I may use reverberation and like something super washed out with reverb and really, really quiet, but not quite gone to create kind of that dynamic change, uh, to give that, does that kind of answer that question? <laughs> um, I believe so. I, you know, I, I'd imagine it can also mm -hmm. be used for, um, tension. Yeah, it can, it can absolutely. But, um, going like, the idea of pure silence is actually kind of jarring to our ears. So in music, that's why people don't suddenly cut the sound. And it's actually, uh, if you go from having a lot of sound to none, you can actually get clicks and pops in the mix. Uh, and that's actually kind of a problem we run into a lot as audio engineers, uh, people trying to use pure silence without actually putting a little bit of something still there. So um, it, it really can improve the emotional context of a film though, or even music uh, by using simulated silence let's call it mm -hmm. having a little bit of room tone in there and i know, I know that yeah. that's something uh, probably a lot of our student filmmakers uh know mm -hmm. all too well have made that mistake <laughs> one too many times and and yeah have hopefully learned all the the very very important uh important uh reason to use room tone uh, mm -hmm. uh just for exactly what you were talking about just to make sure yeah. that like that silence isn't pure silence it's not simulated silence or that right atmosphere that we don't realize is there exactly, um exactly uh one more question you know you you went through that list of uh recording software and, mm -hmm. and or even like music editing software i was hoping yeah. maybe you could just quickly like maybe make a recommendation for for folks who don't have a home studio sure. uh and you know really nice condenser microphones mm -hmm. things like that um you know what how would you like what would you recommend for someone to you know capture good sound on the budget in terms of right. So there's a couple different sides to it. And I actually get a little bit into the equipment uh, later in this presentation. But um, as far as like really affordable software, there's one called Reaper. Uh, their website is reaper.fm. I actually use this instead of Pro Tools uh, for pretty much all of my film audio stuff. If I'm composing, I use a piece of software called Ableton just because I like the workflow better for writing. But for editing and mixing and sync, I use uh, Reaper. So Reaper... They have a free full 60 day trial, but the software itself is 60 bucks. Um, it is the cheapest, as far as I know, out there besides something like Audacity. Audacity is free, but it, it's just not quite as robust as some of these other softwares. So I would say save up the 60 bucks and get Reaper. Uh, in terms of microphones, um, it gets a little bit more complicated for location sound because location sound stuff even the cheap stuff is kind of expensive but um getting a field recorder is a good start so zoom the company zoom not this zoom that we're using this webinar for um but zoom the audio company uh makes a device called the h2 i think is their lowest one and it's a stereo microphone and i think you can also plug in a uh an xlr cable which would allow you to plug in pretty much any other type of microphone into it but i would say going for an affordable field recorder and then picking up a good pair of isolating headphones 
Uh, Sennheiser makes a pair called the HD 280s, I believe. And I think those are like 50, 60 bucks, which is not too bad for isolating headphones. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I yeah. think that's it for now. Uh, why don't we, cool. I'll let you get back to it and um, okay. we'll have awesome. another Q&A after next, another couple sections here, but uh, yeah. really cool stuff. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. So let's talk about sound effects, which is a huge part in music. Um, but also sometimes very subtle. There are two methods to adding sound effects to film. As we talked about, we have Foley and sound design. Foley is a synchronous process, whereas, or sorry, where a Foley artist will perform sounds live while watching the film as a Foley engineer records it. So Foley being a Foley artist is, is kind of a performative thing. I mean, it's, it's a lot like acting because you're acting out the sounds. Um, it can create some really, really realistic, accurate sounds for film because effectively you're watching what's supposed to happen and recreating it. Whereas grabbing just some random sample, it may not be exactly the right thing. Things on screen may not happen exactly the same way with a sample would. Uh, whereas with Foley, you have the opportunity to actually completely recreate a sound from scratch. Uh, sound design is an asynchronous process where a sound designer sequences samples on the film timeline. Now, in this case, you can still record samples, but if you're not watching the film while you're recording, it's not fully, it's sound design. Um, sounds can be sourced from a variety of things, including recordings, samples, which can be raw or manipulated sounds, um, synthesizers and effects. Sound effects are typically not modeling reality, but dramatizing it. So. The only film that I can really think of that has fairly accurate, what we would think of as accurate sound design is actually Fight Club. Uh, and even then it's still dramatized because the idea of like a punch, like if I'm punching my hand, it's it's kind of a wimpy sound. It's not like the big thud, like a, a big thump that you would hear in a film. Um, and actually in a lot of, in a lot of cases, uh, fight scenes, it's actually people just punching vegetables. So like cabbage, is one of the big things that people will use to actually get better punch and kick and just general uh, fight sounds. Um, in both cases, in both sound design and Foley, multiple layers can be used to create more robust sounds as we saw in that video before. And uh, sound effects in film may not have originated how you think. Just like I said, a lot of vegetables are used. Um, in a lot of horror movies, uh, fruit, like watermelon is a great thing for getting kind of like those gory, almost like gutsy sounds. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, a lot of a lot of fruit and vegetables are used <laughs> in creating kind of like organic sounds for film. Um, so we have a couple different types of sound effects. We have momentary and ambient sounds. So we have mo um, in momentary sounds, we have impacts and hits. This could be, you know, our fight scenes, uh, footsteps, which are a really, really overlooked, but really critical thing in film. Um, animal sounds, human sounds, anything that happens once and is not kind of a continuous noise. Let's go back to footsteps for a second. Footsteps are, while they're so important, they're super difficult to do because you have to kind of match the, not, not only do you have to match the material of the shoe and the material of what the shoe is walking on. You also have to think about the person wearing it and the ambience of that location. So you don't want to record footsteps in a hallway for somebody who's out in a field because you're going to get that weird reverb of a hallway and not in a field, uh, extremely difficult, but it really can make or break a film. Um, typically a mixture of fully, oh, sorry. Uh, and then we have ambient sound examples like nature and city noises. Um, these are more continuous sounds that it's kind of like a drone, something that you may not necessarily notice in the background. HVAC is actually a really, really good example of that and room tone. Um, so typically a mixture of Foley and sound design are used in film, uh, just because it's not always practical to only use Foley or only use sound design. And sometimes you may need sounds that don't exist. Uh, if, if, like Star Trek is a, probably a pretty good example of that in Star Wars because you have real things that do exist like people and clothing, but then you have things like lightsabers and you have uh, laser guns and all sorts of other things. 
uh, spaceships. <laughs> we don't have those. Well, we do, but not the same ones. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of up to the sound designers to help give life to sounds of things that don't exist. Um, when designing sound and performing fully, consider the multiple sounds for individual items. So for instance, a door opening would include sounds from the handle and the knob, the hinges, the material of the door, a change in ambience from room to room. Like if you're going in or out of a house, that could really change the uh, overall ambience. Um, this is a video on how the dragon sounds from Game of Thrones were made. Most of us know what a dragon sounds like, but they don't actually exist. And none can stop me. So how does Hollywood know how to make them sound? Just like visual artists, sound designers take inspiration from the world around them. The sounds for creatures like dragons, dinosaurs, and even Chewbacca are based on real-world animals. A sound designer may use sounds from lions, elephants, cats, and even tortoises to create the sound for just one dragon. They'll layer sounds together to create the sound of a non-existent creature. So my dogs are in the second episode of season five. There's a scene that's very intimate. And you hear these like beautiful little nasal whistles. Okay, that was my dog angel. She's in a lot of Drogon stuff and uh, obviously in the wolves. So I took that sound and put it in there. Paula Fairfield is a sound designer for Game of Thrones. Over the last five seasons, Paula has carefully crafted the sounds of Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion. She even used the vocal screams of fans to create the sound generated by Viserion's icy breath in the season seven finale. The final sound design of a scene is complex. It masks the individual sound effects so the viewer can't identify the sources. But we can build our own simplified version of a dragon sound. Combine some alligator, a little elephant, horse, add a pig, and you've got the sound of a dragon. But these are complex creatures. Dragons do more than just roar and breathe fire. Sound designers also use sound to craft a performance for the dragon. Just like Daenerys, Drogon needs to act and perform. Sound designers take emotional cues from animals to influence the sounds they create. I was really proud of the fact that you can always hear from the time he was, you know, a toddler to now, you can hear the essence of him and his voice. You can recognize him as Drogon. And I see them as like your puppy dog. I mean, we have grown up with these puppy dragons in our world, right? And I think that's why there's so much love for them. I've tried to bring my love of that into the show. Each dragon is unique and sound designers are always trying something new. In The Hobbit, director Peter Jackson used Benedict Cumberbatch's original performance as Smaug to influence the sound design of the dragon. Many of the pauses, hisses, and vocal affectations came from Cumberbatch. So tell me, thief, how do you choose to die? <laughs> These details help make Smaug incredibly impactful and memorable. And in the How to Train Your Dragon series, sound designer Randy Tom used different types of sounds for each species of dragon, giving each type of creature their own unique sound. Dragons and other fantastical creatures add a larger-than-life element to stories. The most memorable dragons leave space for the sound to have an emotional effect on the viewer. Without the incredible sound design, Game of Thrones and How to Train Your Dragon may not be as memorable. So, um, very clearly there's a lot of personality added with sound design and Foley, uh, and it really can make or break a film. Now here's one of my favorite examples, is using coconuts to simulate horse.
Warm out! So this is a very famous scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, they don't actually have horses in this film, <laughs> but they do use coconuts to simulate them. So some jobs in uh, sound effects, you have the sound designer, which is typically somebody working on a computer who's going to be sequencing the sounds to the picture. They could also be creating some of the sounds uh, with synthesis and effects. Then you have the Foley artist, uh, a Foley engineer, who's typically the person sitting at the desk recording Foley. And then you have a mixing engineer. So the mixing engineer is kind of the person taking all of this and making it all work in context with the film. Audio post-production, and we will have another Q&A at the end of this audio post section. So audio post-production, uh, we have mixing and mastering. So in mixing, the idea of mixing is you take all of the individual elements and make them work together. Uh, in larger film productions, you'll have a dialogue mixer, a sound effects mixer, and a score mixer or a music mixer. Now, in this case, I'm not saying that they're mixing it and then sending kind of a final you know, simplified version of everything, they still may send what we call stems, which are multiple channels of the same things, but they'll be split up into dialogue and there, there's kind of a code for it. So dialogue is DIA, scoring is MUS, and sound effects are SFX, and they're labeled this way just to make it easier uh, and more organized down the line. Uh, mixing engineers will have to mix differently for each speaker release format, such as stereo, which would be two speakers, 5.1 surround sound, which is five top speakers and one subwoofer, 7.1 surround sound, which is seven top speakers and one subwoofer, ambisonic, three-dimensional sound, and many other things that are coming up to the market. Uh, but the best way to think about mixing is they're taking the individual elements of a whole and making them work together in context, making sure that the right things are loud, the right things are quiet, leaving some dynamics and leaving... Uh, some space for things to breathe. Then we have mastering. So mastering, the way that I like to describe it is creating a commercially viable product. Mastering, an engineer takes the final audio mix and makes it commercially viable. This can mean many things, but usually includes setting the peak volume to loudness standards. So there's a few different loudness standards. Um, there's AES, there's, I can't remember them off the top of my head right now, but that's the most common one in the United States. Um, but basically it's like, it's a maximum peak and a dynamic range. And that may not make too much sense to those of you who don't know much about audio, but the idea is the dy dynamic range is the distance between the quietest and the loudest sound. There's standards on how big that distance should be. Um, now in this case, they're not fixing individual elements. They're just working on the entire mix as a whole. So if there's a frequency imbalance, they'll tweak that a little bit. Uh, they may mess around with the width a little bit, and this will be the final version of the audio for the release. A couple jobs and roles in uh, post-production. You have the audio or sound supervisor. This is somebody who may work through the entire project, though. You may have a post-production sound supervisor on really big projects. Um, then we have ADR engineers, and this is the person who is doing automated dialogue uh, replacement. Then we have mixing engineers and there's the mixing engineers that we talked about. Sometimes you'll have a post-production mixer at the end of the entire project and then the mastering engineer. All right, so let's take some more questions. Hey man, uh, okay, so let's see, let's take, let's look at the list here. We have, um, <laughs> this is a good one, best practices for dialogue cleanup, you know, kind of, and or just oh, making no. <laughs> it pop out of the mix a little bit. Cause we've all probably been there where it doesn't sound as good as we wanted to. Right. Okay. Best practices. Um, first of all, don't have a noisy set. You basically, you want to make sure that you are capturing at the highest quality, just like there, there's the joke and I'm, I'm, you, you can't fix it in post. There's a joke saying, Oh, we'll just fix that in post. That's not a real thing because if the audio is too messy, if the audio is too uh, quiet or too loud or just not recorded well, you there's there's a limited amount of things that you can do to fix it. Just like with video, you know, if you if you record video with way too light or way too bright of lighting or not enough light, you may not be able to color it correctly later down the road, and it's just you can't fix it in post. 
Post should should refine things, but not fix them. That being said, there are some pieces of software out there that can help clean up audio, but they're not cheap. There's one by a company called Isotope called RX. Uh, its goal is to clean up audio. It can reduce clicks and pops. It can reduce reverb. It even has a new feature called Dialog Isolate, which works pretty well, but it's not, it shouldn't be somebody, you know, th there shouldn't be somebody on set saying, oh yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll fix this in RX later uh, because it should be recorded at the highest quality it can be from uh, the beginning. Um, otherwise, make sure you're monitoring everything that's coming in. Always have a pair of headphones, uh, but always check your meters also. So with audio, you can have a pair of headphones and turn the volume really low, so it'll seem like it's really quiet. But if you look at the meter on your field recorder, it may be peaking or clipping, which is which means it's too loud and it could actually have distortion in the final recording. So there's several different steps, um, but the main thing is make sure you check all of your devices down the line. We, there's a concept called signal flow, and you wanna make sure at each point in the signal uh, that everything is not too loud, but not too quiet. Does that kind of answer that? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. There's um, there's a lot of best practices um, for audio recording and mixing and stuff. Um, organization is really important. So when mixing a session, make sure that you have, or actually before you're mixing a session, like if you're doing sound design or dialogue editing or anything, number one thing is label your channels. Uh, oh, this is a really important one that I've dealt with recently from uh, getting past audio for a mix. Don't put your music, your sound effects, and your dialogue on the same channels. Keep them separate. Uh, dialogue, ideally, there should be one channel per speaker. Sound effects, you can put more than one on a channel, but give them space between, like don't overlap them. Same with music. Make sure nothing is overlapping on a single channel. That's a really, really important thing. Nice. Um, another question that's coming in is, mm -hmm. uh, you, you've, uh, you obviously showed us a lot of different types of jobs in the industry as they pertain to audio. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts for anyone who's just coming out of college? Um, you know, what they might like, where are some entry level kind of post audio sure. games that might be kind of out there in the world? Okay. Um, so I actually, my next section kind of talks about that <laughs> in this. So uh, can we circle back to that one after the next section in case it doesn't quite answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, cool. I'm seeing another one that is uh, asking about finding good royalty free music or sound effects, like play, oh. maybe some resources for those people who don't have, you know, again, um, a studio. Audio Blocks is a solid website for that. Um, there's one called First Com that's a little more expensive, but Audio Blocks is probably the cheapest, most affordable option. Uh, actually, the photo of the person with the shotgun microphone earlier uh that guy actually has a great website it's like 10 bucks he calls it free to use sounds and you can individually download each sound but you can pay ten dollars and download all of them at once uh he travels the world and just gets sound effects and ambience and stuff from everywhere huge library overwhelming amount of information on there but um that's a really good one to go with uh and but, but as, as far as royalty free music these days, um, I don't know of a good free resource for that. Um, sometimes just finding a composer who's, you know, who, do, him, who may not have had their first job or is looking to get into that kind of thing might be a good person to work with just as a collaborative thing. Uh, I'm not saying don't pay your composers, definitely pay your composers if you can. But, you know, if it's a first job like indie film or you're doing like a 48 hour film festival, um, project or something for a campus movie festival, and it's like your first thing, uh, it could be good to find somebody to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm always a bigger fan of actually working with really human beings. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, know, uh, I know that Kevin McLeod is, is, a, is a guy, I think he has a, a website called Incom Tech. Uh, okay. He, he's a pretty popular um, composer who's, he, he's shown up in countless campus movie fest films. Um, awesome. And uh, so, I mean, he, he, that I think he usually has yeah. most of the music royalty free as long as he gets credits. I think mm -hmm. YouTube has a library as well. Yeah. Of, um, of I think they do now. Music, but but I think as long as you put it on YouTube, it's, you know, yeah. It's, it's, you know so yeah, cool. Um, 
All right. I think we are good on questions until the very end. So okay, we'll, yeah, we'll circle back to that one about finding entry level jobs because a lot of it is networking. But I'm, I'm I'll talk about that in just a few. Sounds good. So how to get into sound for film? <laughs> Picking a role. If you want to work on set, uh, location sound, and and like I said, I think uh, I'll I'll try to find a way to make this accessible, this PowerPoint accessible to anybody who wants it just for these individual notes here, because um, especially if any of you are watching on your phone, this might be way too small to read. <laughs> so if you want to work on set, uh, the jobs that are kind of available for audio are location sound recordist and location sound mixer. The minimum requir requ uh, requirement for a location sound recordist or boom operator is a shotgun microphone, a boom pole, which is the pole that you put the microphone on, isolating headphones, a field recorder, memory cards, and cables. Then a location sound mixer, uh, typically experience or past work in mixing. And this is something that goes into broadcast a little bit too, because in broadcast, like if you have news or if you have live television, you need somebody mixing it on the fly, and that can be actually a pretty hard job. So they typically look for somebody who has experience in mixing live music. Uh, if you want to work in a studio or at home, Recording engineer, so this could be somebody who's recording voiceover or ADR, uh, mixing engineer, and sound designers. If you want to do Foley, so the reason I kept Foley separate, you can do Foley in a studio, you can do Foley at home. Um, it kind of depends on the project and the budget more than anything like many things do. Uh, but minimum requirements for Foley, oh, sorry. Uh, if you're working in a studio, a lot of what you have to do is know how your software works and understand recording and have a room dedicated for whatever it is you're doing. Um, acoustic treatment is not cheap, but not terribly expensive. But I'm going to tell you the foam, like the acoustic foam is not as good as people make it seem. So go for the, the panels that are made out of uh, like rock wool insulation or um, fiberglass insulation. There's a, there's a couple of good brands out there. One's called Prima Acoustic, and you can treat a room for under $1,000, which is not too bad for that. Um, if it's a small room, you can do it for under 500, which is pretty good. Uh, so Foley, you have to have an interest in acting. It's kind of the most, um, I'm trying to think of a way to explain it. It's, it's a lot of, it's very performative. So you have to have kind of an interest in acting, a collection of a lot of random items. As you saw, that other studio had just all sorts of crazy stuff. But you also need an audio interface, a DAW, microphones, headphones, and some way to watch a film live while recording. This can be a TV or a projector, or even a, a small, um, like a computer monitor, as long as it will play in time. And then if you want to work as a supervisor, you have to kind of work your way up and have experience working on multiple projects and probably work on multiple roles um, above. How to get started. It can be kind of difficult to find work in film, but a really good way to start is by joining a 48 hour film festival project or student film projects. Uh, the idea is you wanna build a portfolio. That's the number one thing you need in this industry is a portfolio. Um, Another, so, so if you're trying to get into something like sound design, it can be really hard to do sound design for a 48 hour film festival. I scored one once, which was just outrageous. Um, and I don't recommend doing that. It's better to have music already written for that, but we did it and we finished actually a little bit late. So we weren't able to submit, but we finished. <laughs> but if you want to get into something like scoring or sound design, one really good way to do that is by taking scenes from films that are already around and doing your own music and doing your own sound design you know obviously you don't own the video so you can't say hey this is mine you can say hey i redid the sounds for this and it's really good to put a note on there saying what you did and what you didn't um this can also be a really good way to get some voiceover work by redoing voices from uh various characters um a creative professional is only as good as their portfolio so start building one as soon as you have something to share very important, like I said. Um, these days, it's super easy to create a website. Uh, you can also just put stuff on Dropbox or Drive. But the way that I describe it, be ready to text somebody a link that they can look or listen to your stuff. Because you may be out networking somewhere at some networking event for film, and somebody says, oh, what do you do? 
be ready to hand them something. Uh, and we'll talk about networking uh, before we are done with this, but portfolio is super important. Um, have be, be ready, be ready to show off work. Uh, also, don't try to do it all. <laughs> don't try to be the location sound recordist, sound designer, Foley artist, um, mastering engineer, post-production supervisor person. Start with one or two things, you know? Uh, I mean, you, you can definitely be the location sound recordist and the mixer. You may have to do something like that for film because if you're working on indie films, you will have multiple jobs, but don't try to do all of them. Pick a few things, master them, branch out. Okay, uh, I wanna talk about networking really fast before we get back to some of these questions. Um, so we have a few, we, not everybody here is in Atlanta, but I'm gonna kind of talk about how things are in Atlanta and you probably will get some insight on what you can look at for in your own studios or studios, cities, cities is the word. <laughs> so um, in Atlanta, we have something called Film Bar Mondays and yeah, some college students aren't 21 yet, so they can't attend these, but Film Bar Mondays is a really good way to network with other professionals in the industry. I know several major cities do have these. The idea is that every Monday, film professionals meet at a bar. Uh, now, that being said, it's not one that you show up with your headshots and your resume and your business card, you know, your portfolio, a laptop showing your video. You don't want to you don't want to show up because the idea you don't want to do that because the way it's set up is to meet and befriend other people. But by creating real relationships, you're more likely to find some work. Another really important thing is. Uh, some and this is something that I see a lot in the game design industry is composers just they'll go on Reddit into the game design Reddit and just say composer for hire, composer for hire, composer for hire. And I see the same sort of thing in some of the film production groups on Facebook. Uh, people just looking for composition jobs and just posting there, you know, and it's there's no there's no personal connection there. And it's it's something that I also learned the hard way. You you really need to meet people and get to know them a little bit because it's partly your skill, but it's also partly knowing somebody and, and them thinking about you in the right place at the right time. They're not going to think of, oh yeah, that person posted on Facebook two weeks ago. Let me hit them up, you know, to score my film. They're going to say, Hey, I know this composer that I've worked with in the past, or this new composer that I met at film bar, you know, has some really great stuff. I'm going to see what they can do for this indie project. So creating these real relationships is important. And I know it's like, super hard right now because we're in the middle of this pandemic and you can't really go to bars and you can't, you know, go network that easily. But even right now, people are still doing events over Zoom and over chat and just just getting involved in conversation is a really good way to um, to meet people just chiming in when you know, when somebody says, Hey, I need a little help with this audio thing. This is a problem that I have. Can somebody walk me through it? Just being that person that answers that question can be the thing that gets you a job down the road. Um, all right, let's take some questions. <clears throat> awesome, great presentation. Um, Thank you. Uh, and I'll, I'll give a shameless plug for um, Ideas United, um, which is the parent company of Canvas Family Fest. We, we also have a, uh, a way to network and connect um, and get um, some early gigs as well. Uh, you can go to ideasunited.com slash network and find out uh, a little bit more about how, uh, you know, we uh, we take folks just like Campus Movie Fest alumni and other filmmakers and storytellers around the world uh, and try to, to uh, connect them and get them to that, to the next step of, uh, of their careers and, um, you know, feed them some gigs and, uh, and host uh, networking, uh, events just like this one uh, obviously when covid's over will it'll be a little easier to do um <laughs> but uh idsunited.com slash network um and uh that said the last couple questions here that we have um two of them that kind of relate to the same thing uh okay. going back and forth between production sound and post that like post yeah. sound effects um you know how how often do you see folks kind of bouncing between like the live on set production versus uh being mostly in the studio or behind the computer um and then similarly like is it how important is it to know one side of it when you're working in the other right like if you're in the yeah. 
the studio for the most part, how important is it to really know the on-set live part of things and vice versa? So kind of a two-parter layered question okay. there. But. <laughs> well, first of all, those things are not typically happening at the same time. So it can be something that you do both. Uh, it really depends on the size of the production. Indie stuff, definitely a lot more likely to wear a lot of hats. Um, I've been in projects where I recorded the location sound, I did the mix, I scored it, I did the sound design and the master. Like all of the audio was me. Um, there was a, yeah, I did that on a documentary uh, about a football coach. It's on my website actually. And there were only two people that I wasn't physically there for recording, uh, but I did all of the rest of the audio for that. And it was a lot, but um, I would say it was pretty rewarding. It's just tiresome. It's just a lot to do, a lot to think about. And at a certain point, you kind of like, um, when you've listened to something a certain amount of times, you stop hearing it the same way you would objectively the first time uh, because of how our brains work. So if you've heard something over and over and over, and this is something that happens to a lot of uh, composers who try to mix their own music. And I'm not saying don't mix your own music. I'm just saying this is a, a common trend. Um, they'll try to mix it at, you know, 5 a.m. when they've just finished the composition and they've listened, you know, to the same 12 second section, like hundreds of times, like four or 500 times because they're trying to tweak that one thing. So uh, I would say it's, it's good to, it's good to understand the entire process, but try to focus on um, a facet or a few facets of it. So, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon for location sound people to also know how to do ADR and dialogue mixing and maybe mixing the entire project, but it's not as common for somebody for, who's like a composer to also be doing the dialogue um, or the sound design. Although sound design is kind of, it's, it's complicated because it depends on the, the complexity of what you're working on. If you're working on kind of a documentary style thing that is on uh, somebody in an office, you're not gonna need probably as complex sound design as Star Wars. So um, something like Star Wars is going to have a dedicated or actually a team of dedicated sound designers and Foley artists, um, whereas indie films are not going to have that kind of budget and that large of a team. So it more than anything, it kind of depends on the budget and regarding um, how much you need to know of the other processes, I would say a fair amount, but you don't have to be an expert. So if you're like the post-production mixer you should understand how people record on set. You should understand like some concepts about recording, mic placement, that kind of thing. Um, but you don't have to be the one actually holding the microphone. Does that kind of answer that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think they're definitely- I, I would say like a solid understanding of the process, but you don't have to be like the expert they call for that kind of thing. Yeah, and I'm sure like understanding uh some of the you know standard practices or decisions that behind mm -hmm. like why they might go with the law versus something else uh, mm -hmm. versus a shotgun for a scene to create a certain effect yeah. or to create distance or whatever the case exactly. Uh, exactly you know knowing why they may have done something a certain way so that you can take that audio signal and, and yeah. take it further um, and communication that's that's really important in the process communication like don't uh don't cut off communication between the location sound person because they may have had to have recorded something a certain way because of how the set was set up. You know, they, there may not have been room for them to stand really where they needed to be to get the best recording. So an open line of communication is really important in, uh, in all facets of creative media and pretty much life. <laughs> uh, in, in Campus Movie Fest, we have a lot of uh, folks kind of trying and stretching out different roles. And, and we mm -hmm. see a lot of people who especially like are, are you know, first time directors. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to think, you know, as, as someone who works in sound, what mm -hmm. is like the best direction you sometimes get from like, you know, what's, what's the best way to direct folks who are in sound? It's, it's, it's harder than like, you know, mm. telling actors <laughs> to or whatever, you know, it's, it's how, how do you do that in the sound field? I think a really important thing for, uh, for any project is having examples. Um, so if a director is trying to go for like a specific mood, having some examples ready to show a sound designer, uh, it, because another thing is like there, there are ter there's terminology in film and terminology in audio that kind of don't really coincide. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. So, so when I was studying audio production, uh, sound design to me was actually just the idea of like synthesizing and creating sound. And when I started working with film, I kept hearing sound design and I was like, ah, oh, cool. I'm gonna get to play with a lot of synthesizers in this. And it wasn't exactly, um, 
the case, sound design turned out to be what I just talked about, what I've talked about in this uh, presentation. So it's kind of different across industries. Uh, and some of that terminology sometimes gets lost or like when people are trying to describe a sound, you know, if, if it's uh, bright or dark or crispy or smooth or whatever, it, people may use words that don't necessarily mean the same thing to somebody else. So it kind of goes back to communication, but that's when having an example is really helpful because you can say, I want it to sound like this and kind of describe what about it, you know, why, what, what, what is this sound that I want? Um, another thing is mood and emotion. So like kind of getting a, a brief of what the scene is really like the, the depth of the scene. So it's not uncommon to pass sound designers and composers, the actual script before any of this stuff happens. So they can kind of have the wheels turning on, um, how they're going to approach the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the, I just want to make sure that you feel, uh, in terms of circling back, I know we talked mm -hmm. about networking. Um, yeah. If you have any other insight about, uh, you know, like someone like the basic and like entry level jobs or ways right. to kind of get in on like some, you know, like yeah. for, it's been a while for me, but, you know, like doing like internships at like studios yeah. and or, I mean, <laughs> get them right. Um, or like just doing, being a boom yeah. up for a French short film, you know, things like that. Or, right. are, there, are there anything else that you can think of that can, you know, be a kind of first step? Um, some of the unions actually just need people running cable and that's a really good way to get your way in. Uh, it, some of the unions can be kind of hard to get in. I know in Atlanta, you have to have two signatures from people already in it, but, um, it's a great way to network and get in there, but yeah, doing student films and indie films is a really good way to start. Um, and there are some websites out there. It's not like, you know, you, you, I have never, ever had any work come from <laughs> LinkedIn, um, I think LinkedIn is better for like tech, but uh, there's a website called Production Hub that I know posts jobs. But honestly, sometimes uh, just looking on like Facebook groups and Reddit uh, subreddits can be a good way to find that first job because there may be, you know, you might see like filmmaker seeking composer or I need a location sound person for two hours for, you know, uh, we, can, we can throw you 50 bucks kind of thing. You know, it just good small projects that may get you a little bit further on. I have not found a lot of internships for this kind of stuff um, because the industry is kind of, it's complicated. Uh, it's the same thing with music. It's really a lot of people who have their studios and they have their list of people they would call next, you know, they're not going to pull somebody that they don't have experience working with already. Um, but that being said, you can find some studio internships. It's just kind of hard right now because of the uh, pandemic. Um, that being said, also studio internships may not end up like there's there's a bad rep for studio internships being um, something where you end up just kind of like taking out the trash, making coffee. But that sometimes as long as you're getting paid, don't do that for free. Uh, that can be the thing that gets you in the door with somebody who's willing to give you that chance. So it's kind of both sides. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I think that's all uh, I'm seeing right now. I think it might be, uh, I think that might be time to wrap up. Do you have any other last thoughts? Any last uh, pieces of advice that you want to say as a parting word or? <laughs> Build your portfolios. <laughs> Build your portfolios. And uh, uh, have contracts. Contracts are really important. Um, contracts are how you, avoid redoing the same job a bunch of times. Don't do sound design until you have picture lock. Uh, don't write music until you have picture lock. Hmm. Yeah. Mix, mix, <laughs> uh, uh, what, after you mix, listen to it on laptops, listen to it on TVs, listen to it on oh, always yeah. with and everything and listen. And so, um, listen on several different means, uh, if you have the capability to. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great words. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that makes sense as a way to wrap this up. I really appreciate that. Um, I don't know if uh, people want, well, I guess I'll put a little clap emoji here for uh, <laughs> reactions on Zoom today. Okay, well, uh, I'm sure that people all around the nation are clapping for you right now. I really, I, uh, oh, again, no. <laughs> it, was, it was really informative. Um, I really appreciate all of the information you gave us today. And I it, appreciate y'all having me on here. Um, so uh, a couple more last words for housekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, 
with Campus Movie Fest, we have a premiere coming up. Uh, we can see the best of the best films made over the last month. Uh, this February 24th, which is next Wednesday, be sure to uh, go to cmf.com and tune in. Uh, hopefully we see a lot of great sound, uh, movies with great sound there. Um, and then heads up that the next movie making week is coming up soon, April 6th through 12th. So start planning now. You'd better have flawless audio in these films. Sign now, sign up now at cmf.com. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing what you give us. Uh, we also want you to, of course, follow us on all the social media platforms, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, hashtag CMF at Campus Movie Fest. And of course, campusmoviefest.com slash CMF uh, is there for a good time. Uh, thanks again on behalf of Campus Movie Fest. Uh, stay warm, stay safe, keep making movies. And at George Antonios, uh, make sure you visit uh, George on Instagram as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.